down to the size of a city. The diameter of the sun itself is roughly 109 Earths across if you stacked them edge to edge. And the total mass of, or the size of the sun can fit roughly 1.3 million Earths inside of it. Yeah, I, I see a question in the chat and I'm going to get to that. So I'm glad that you already are curious about something I will be covering. So the mass of the sun itself is roughly 330,000 times that of the Earth itself. So if we're thinking about a neutron star that's roughly one and a half to two times the mass of the sun, that is the equivalent of taking about half a billion solar masses and compressing that down just to the size of the city. So this I'm showing, of course, in comparison to Michigan, where I am currently giving this talk. And if we blow this up a little bit closer, this diameter of the neutron star, so across from end to end, is the equivalent of driving from Wayne State University, where I work, to the Detroit Metro Airport. In comparison, if you were on campus today at George Mason University, you'd be able to fit an entire neutron star and then some within the distance between George Mason University all the way to Washington, DC, where you have that upcoming event. So more about neutron stars, let's go over a very brief history of how we came to discover neutron stars. It was back in the 1800s where we had evidence that there is some kind of subatomic building blocks that make up everything that we know. So that was the first evidence that we had that atoms existed. And this whole brief history is meant to show that really science is a long and iterative process. And you have to have a series of discoveries before you can make new discoveries, right? It wasn't until the early 1900s that we discovered that within an atomic nucleus or inside an atom, there is a nucleus, right? There's some kind of very dense region inside of your atom itself. And this was done through using Ernest Rutherford's scattering experiments where they shot electrons at an atomic nucleus and noticed that some of these things were deflecting and that had to mean that there was something with a positive charge at the center of an atom. Roughly 20 years later, there was the first discovery of the fact that there are neutrons. So there is a particle within the atom that has no charge whatsoever. It wasn't until this was discovered that only a year later, after the discovery of a neutron, that Walter Bade and Fritz Zwicky proposed that, well, if you have these particles and they have no charge, then in theory, you could have a collection of these neutrons in some region. And that was the first idea of perhaps having a ball of neutrons or a neutron star completely existing. So this was theorized, but it still took a long time before we actually found any evidence to confirm this idea. So from the discovery of the neutron and knowing more about what is at the center of the atomic nucleus, we determined roughly 22 or 32 years later that actually these protons and neutrons that make up our atomic nucleus actually are made up of even smaller particles, which are known as quarks, which are represented here as these three colored dots to indicate these smaller subatomic particles that make up the larger proton and neutron. And roughly the same amount of time, so we have 32 years later after proposing that neutron stars exist, that the first evidence of neutron stars were found. So what was discovered by a graduate student at the time, which is Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell now, she discovered doing radio observations, this periodic signal in the radio that was coming repeatedly every 1.3 seconds. So when this was first discovered, it was theorized that perhaps this is actually some communication from extraterrestrial life. And we finally have some kind of indication of another intelligent species. And so this signal was first dubbed as LGM1, which stands for Little Green Man 1. However, it was quickly ruled out to be some kind of extraterrestrial signal due to the fact that there were more of these signals discovered around the Milky Way looking at different directions of the sky. So for seeing a signal coming from different directions in the sky, it's more likely that it's coming from an object that's astrophysical in nature. 
So it was soon theorized that perhaps this is some kind of pulsating star that we're seeing, or what is now known as a pulsar, right? A pulsating star. However, because these signals were happening so rapidly and repeatedly, it was way too fast to be coming from a standard star like our sun. Our sun, for reference, rotates every 27 days. And these signals are indicating that this object is rotating every 1.3 seconds. If the sun were to start rapidly rotating every 1.3 seconds, it would completely tear itself apart. The central fugal forces would overcome its own gravity that's holding it together. So this instead is telling us that if we have these very rapidly repeating signals, the object must be super compact in size. So this was the first evidence that we have a neutron star, something very, very small that could fit in the size of a city, but have a very large mass. So we have the first evidence of neutron stars, but how is it that a neutron star forms? So to go for the formation of neutron stars, we'll start with a brief recap of star formation. So in our Milky Way galaxy, we have clouds of gas, and these gas can contract into the point where they become hot and they can start igniting, creating a protostellar environment where you have your star at the center and the disk around it in which planets can form. The central star can either be of a varying differences in mass, but there are lower mass stars like our own sun that fuse hydrogen. And then there are high mass stars, maybe 10 times the mass of our own sun that we call, they still fuse hydrogen, but they can fuse up to heavier elements. The way that these stars progress is completely determined by their mass itself. At the low mass end, once the star runs out of hydrogen, it's going to contract and the core will contract and the outer regions will expand until it can start to fuse some helium. And that is the red giant phase afterwards. Once you undergo this hydrogen helium fusion and maybe you go up to carbon and oxygen burning at the center most of the star, the outer regions get blown away due to increased radiation coming from the central most regions and you will be left with a white dwarf. Now, a white dwarf, if you're unaware, is the collapsed core of a lower mass star that is being completely held up by electron degeneracy pressure. So you can kind of think about how electrons have a negative charge. They don't want to be put together really closely. They're going to hold each other up once they become too tightly bound. Conversely, on the more massive side, you can undergo hydrogen fusion into helium, then you can have helium burning, carbon burning, oxygen burning, all the way up to very heavy elements. But the rapid rate at which the material burns as you go through the subsequent stages is going to have a giant, red giant, super giant phase into the point where once you reach the core being composed of iron, you're no longer releasing energy and it collapses in a very rapid event that is highly energetic known as supernovae. The result of this can either be a black hole or a neutron star, just depending on the mass of the remnant core that is left behind. So just to recap, at the end of a high mass star's life, you have this onion-like structure in the star just based on all of the material that has been burned throughout its life. Again, once you reach that iron stage, you're no longer releasing energy within the star itself to stop itself from collapsing. So since there's no outward radiation of energy, the star collapses. And as it collapses, it expels those outer layers. And this happens in a very, very rapid time scale. The time scale of this animation is how quickly that core collapses and those outer areas begin to get expelled. This collapse is only going to halt when the neutrons themselves come into close contact. So again, based on that theory that was posited about if you have neutral charges, they can handle being really close together without repulsing each other. So you have a very neutron rich environment because you have so much energy that the protons and the electrons are able to fuse together, create these neutrons and all on a time scale that is a fraction of a second. So why do we care? Why do we care about neutron stars? Why are they of interest? 
Well, we know that neutron stars are responsible for a number of energetic phenomena, such as gamma ray bursts. These gamma ray bursts are extremely energetic extragalactic events that are thought to occur either when two neutron stars collide or you have a collapse directly into a black hole itself. These produce the same amount of energy in less than a second that the sun does in its entire 10 billion year lifetime of fusing material. And thankfully, this little schematic is kind of showing what we think these events look like. They are highly collimated. So then you can see that beam coming out of the screen and emitted where well, you can only see them when they're oriented close to our line of sight. However, because of the extreme amount of energy that's released during these events, if a gamma ray burst were to happen in our own galaxy and directly aligned with Earth, the Earth would be sterilized instantly in, if one of these events were to happen. So thankfully, these have all been extragalactic events or at least not oriented along our line of sight. We also know that neutron stars have matter inside of them that must exist in a state that we are unable to propose to make on Earth. So in order to understand what this means, I'm going to recall and remind you of different phases of matter. So we know of liquid, solids, and gas. The best way of visualizing this is using water, right? We know that at very, very cold temperatures, ice freezes and becomes a solid. As it warms up, it's going to melt, turn into a liquid, and as it warms even further, you're going to have evaporation turning into a gas. If we look at a phase diagram, this is going to tell us how matter behaves under certain conditions. So this is showing the phase diagram of water itself. In these regions, we have ice, where the phase diagram shows us where we'd have a solid state, a liquid state, or a vapor in the case of if it boils away. And this tells us how water behaves under certain conditions. So we're used to having at the pressure of one atmosphere, so here on Earth level, and we have the values that we see when we're in a solid state freezing, when we're in a liquid, and when we boil. As you change the pressure, you can see this changes the regions in which we would find water in a solid, a liquid, or a gas with being at very, very low pressure, having no stable liquid, being at very high pressure, you mostly have a liquid phase. So that brings us to the analogy of how does nuclear matter, so how does like the nucleus behave under certain sets of conditions? So this is very similar to what I just showed, showing the temperature and the pressure. Here, we're now showing temperature on a different axis, and this is a chemical potential, which is just similar for density, which is also a proxy for pressure. So neutron stars on this diagram are probing a very, very different phase space than we can access by lab-based experiments. You may have heard about the particle accelerator collisions, like the Large Hadron Collider, and that's probing very, very high temperatures in low-density regions that are similar to what would have been seen around the Big Bang. For reference, this one to two uh, GeV in chemical potential energy is showing one to six times over of the atomic nucleus density. You can see this is showing where we have phases of matter that are nucleonic. So you have your atomic nucleus, and you can see that neutron stars probe a very low region and very, very high densities. And we can even get into a phase space region where perhaps inside of the neutron star, we no longer have those neutrons and they've actually shifted into just having quarks. We have free floating quarks in the center. So this is why these are interesting aspects to study, not just from astrophysical phenomenon, but also understanding how does matter behave under certain conditions. So some fundamental questions can be answered by studying neutron stars. So here is showing a very simple cross-section schematic of a neutron star itself. Remember, we cannot create these conditions of these ultra-dense cold matter in Earth-based laboratories. So in this outermost region of the neutron star, this is where we have that the density is less than that of an atomic nucleus. So here we have a good understanding of how matter is behaving based on our understanding 
of high density situations, but not exceeding that of an atomic nucleus itself. And this is known as the crust region, roughly 10 to 20% of the neutron star radius is composed by this crust. Once we reach the core, that is where our understanding breaks down. We don't know if the matter is just some solid state of nucleons, so atomic nuclei in this region, or if we're able to generate some kind of exotic matter phase that we haven't seen, or if we have, again, those quarks just existing in some kind of matter in this region, or a combination. The difficulty is that we just don't know. So how would we figure out what the internal composition of a neutron star is and how the matter is behaving? This is by determining the equation of state. And this just is a relation between the pressure and density in the interior region of the neutron star itself. The pressure and density is what sets the macroscopic qualities like the mass and the radius of the neutron star itself. So if we know what the equation of state is, we should know what the mass and radius of the object is. So we can use that by measuring masses and radii, we can then determine that equation of state itself. So theorists come up with models based on assumptions of how matter behaves under certain conditions. This is usually based off of lab data in these more energetic high dense or low density regimes and then trying to extrapolate down to cold high densities but it's really astronomers that seek the observational evidence to either confirm or refute some of these proposed models so this is showing what some example equations of state of ultra dense cold matter but tracing out in terms of mass and radii so I see a question about spin being part of the equation of state, and it does play a factor in determining the equation of state because these neutron stars are not static. They do have some rotation, and that can change the shape of the neutron star itself, and I can talk more about that. So here we have the mass of the neutron star versus the radius with some different theoretical equation of state tracks proposed. And this, these equations of state are just saying what the mass and the radius should be under some set of assumptions of the internal composition and how the matter inside is interacting. So blue is showing if you have just nucleons inside of there, so just atomic nuclei, or if you have some combination of nucleons and exotic matter, or if you have just some free floating strange quark matter in the central most regions. And you can see that these all trace out different predictions for mass and radius. However, there should only be one description of how matter behaves under certain sets of conditions. So we need to find those observational evidence to rule out some of these predictions. This top region is where causality becomes violated. So that's where you have something that's too massive and too compact that suddenly your speed of sound within the neutron star itself exceeds the speed of light and nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So your neutron star would be unstable to any kind of changes in its construction. So that's an unstable region and excluded. Okay, from the observational standpoint, we have known measured masses of neutron stars from binary neutron star systems. And you can see that these are around one and a half solar masses and they agree with all proposed equations of state. So not much information is gleaned from these lower mass stars. It's only when we get to more massive neutron stars that have been measured that we begin to rule out equations that cannot produce a stable neutron star above two solar masses. So now we have some constraints on the equation of state. I should note that I'm not showing all proposed equations of state that has been hypothesized. This is a very, very populated plane. And I just wanted to show a few examples so that it becomes clear what the behavior of the equation of state is given these internal compositions. So this gives us some constraining power, rules out any equation of state that cannot produce a stable neutron star of two solar masses. But you can see that there's still a number of equations that agree, so it becomes clear we also need to focus on getting radius constraints. So we need both of these aspects to really narrow down the allowed region on this equation of state plane. 
So that's one of the big things that I try to look at and a very active area of the field. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some ways that we try to do this. So how do we measure their properties? Because the neutron star is very, very physically small, I showed you that artist representation earlier and I already told you and kind of gave it away that we can't measure the radius of the neutron star from imaging. We have to look at this kind of indirectly. So we're not able to take a direct image. For context, this is like trying to measure the thickness of a strand of hair, but now you put the hair on the moon. So it's extremely small and we're not able to actually discern the physical size. So then how is it that we do learn about their properties? How do we get any kind of constraints on the size scale of a neutron star? And this all comes from indirect information. We look at information that comes from gravitational waves, as well as different properties that we can observe from light itself, so the electromagnetic spectrum. So I'm gonna start with talking about gravitational waves and neutron stars. So from Einstein's concept of gravity, we know that mass itself warps the fabric of space-time. And the exact warping that occurs just depends on how concentrated the mass is. So here's a comparison of the sun, a neutron star, which is much more compact, but about the size of the sun. And for context, a black hole, which is even more compact, but this is showing on a same mass scale. So you can see just how warped the fabric of space-time comes becomes and you have this large gravitational pull around it. Now, if you take two of these objects that have these extreme warps in space-time and you start to move them, this is going to be causing ripples in the fabric of space-time itself that we can actually observe. So the gravitational wave events that come from neutron star, neutron star mergers are of interest. As your neutron stars become close together, you're gonna to have that the binary is going to shrink as the angular momentum is carried away by the gravitational waves itself. At the end most regions, when they become close together, they become tidally deformed. You can see they turn to a teardrop shape right before merging. And those tidal deformations, which occur due to the gravity of each neutron star pulling on the other one, those deformations from spherical to that teardrop shape are what are imprinted on the gravitational wave signatures that are then observed. These gravitational wave events are measured through using laser interferometers with extremely long perpendicular baselines. The example being LIGO and Virgo. So LIGO has two different locations to get different constraints and confirm whether an event is real. And then they combine that with any kind of event that is detected by any other gravitational wave detector on Earth. So the exact setup of a laser interferometer is quite genius. You have these two perpendicular baselines. So you have a laser coming in, being split off into two baselines, bounced back by a mirror, recombined down to our detector. These baselines are quite long, roughly four kilometers in each direction. Just checking the chat. And it's constructed such that if there is no gravitational wave passing through our fab the detectors, then there will be no signal that ends up on the detector itself. However, as a gravitational wave ripple comes through where the detectors are located, it's going to stretch and shrink the baselines differently since they are in perpendicular directions. What that is going to do is then bring the light out of phase because the distance that has just traveled down to the mirror and back slightly shifts and now you will actually have a signal on the detector itself so measuring that signal over time is going to tell us something about the event that came through and the two merging objects themselves so this brings us to the exciting event of gravitational wave event of 170817 so this is based on the year the month the date so this was august 17th 2017 where we had the first detection of two neutron stars merging. Here is showing the frequency map, so basically the signal that's seen over time, and you can see as it shrinks, it goes up to a higher frequency before it actually merges, and there's no longer a signal read 
by the detector. What was the smoking gun that this had to have been two neutron stars is that we actually detected a signal just two seconds after the merging in the gravitational waves, there was a gamma ray burst, which is something that we think is associated with the merging of neutron stars. And this is our best evidence of that occurring. And these were both coincidental on the same region of the sky. So it wasn't just that we had the merging of the black holes and then there was a gamma ray burst in a different direction. This, these two events were correlated. And the correlation and the deformation of the gravitational wave event itself tells us something about the mass and the radius of the neutron star. So this is showing that equation of state plane again with the different constraints based on the mass of the two compact objects that have merged. So they were able to get a constraint on the neutron star radius based on that tidal deformations imprinted on the signal that's roughly at a level of 3.6 kilometers uncertainty. So again, this is indirect evidence, but 3.6 kilometers is quite a good constraint, roughly less than the 10% level. More events will obviously increase this, but we want to make sure that any measurement we're getting from a single technique can be verified independently with another. So this is a very synergistic approach to still look into other neutron stars and get better constraints. Also from this event, we learned more about where some of atomic elements come from. So here is showing the periodic table and all of the elements that we may be familiar with and their different origins. So we can see there's the option of the Big Bang for hydrogen and helium. We have dying low mass stars shown as the star, white dwarf supernovae, radioactive decay. There's cosmic ray collisions, which are just really energetic particles dying high mass stars, so supernovae, merging neutron stars, which is what we are talking about here with that gravitational wave event and the humid wave ones. So it's interesting to note on here is that some of the most precious elements that we have for making jewelry completely created from the merging of neutron stars. There's no other source that we've been able to determine so far that creates these elements. And so here, all of your jewelry that you're wearing came from two neutron stars merging, which is one of my favorite facts. So that's all from the gravitational wave side, but again, we want those complementary approaches. So the other way that we observe these is through electromagnetic radiation. And when I showed you the phase, nuclear phase diagram before, roughly the temperatures that were shown on the y-axis were roughly around 1 keV or less and that energy actually corresponds to x-rays so what we do is we look at the x-ray emission from these objects to learn more about how the properties of neutron stars are as you're aware X-rays are extremely energetic. This is why we use them for taking X-ray images and medical purposes to see what our bones, if they're broken or if they're not broken. And they pass through most matter. So how is it that we actually observe these X-rays if they tend to not interact with anything? Also, the other drawback is that they're, well, it's actually a benefit, right? They're blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. So that's great for us as humans, makes it a little bit more challenging for actually observing X-rays. But as you had talked about earlier in your meeting, you have that pesky weather to usually deal with when you're doing ground-based observing. We don't have to worry about the Earth's weather when we're observing X-rays, so that's a benefit. Since this is an astronomy club, you may be familiar with all these different kind of telescope types of how you can observe the sky. You have reflecting telescopes that use mirrors or refracting telescopes that use glass to focus in optical light to make observations. But since x-rays are so energetic, they would completely pass through these kinds of detectors. So we have to use different techniques to be able to focus down x-rays and observe them. How this is done is that you actually take nested shells of mirrors that are concentric within each other to deflect the x-rays marginally down to where you have your detector some range away. So these are nested shells uh, that are parabolic and hyperbolic, so double bouncing down to your detector where you can actually observe those high energy photons. So one really exciting mission that was installed on the International Space Station in 2017 is known as NICER. 
It's the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer that is on the outside of the International Space Station. It's roughly the size of an indus industrial dishwasher. You can see it has roughly 52 different concentrating optics to observe X-rays. And the benefit of NICER is that since it's on the International Space Station, there are cameras that can actually observe NICER as it observes other sources. So this is a direct video taken of NICER on the International Space Station, not an artist video. And you can see the solar panels transversing in the background. NICER has a very large collecting area because it has a 52 different concentrating optics to detect x-rays. And it has the added benefit of having really, really small timing res resolution. So every photon that comes in gets tagged to roughly less than 300 nanosecond accuracy. So what is NICER doing, right? NICER is aimed for exploring the internal composition of a neutron star by looking at the gravitational light bending of hot spots on the surface of the star itself. So for context, the gravity on a neutron star, because you have a lot of mass and a very small amount of space, is roughly 131 billion times stronger than the gravity here on Earth. Because of this, it's able to change the trajectory of outgoing photons. So this is gravitational light bending effect. So this video is going to show what this means. So on the left side, we have a star with no gravitational light bending effects. So we're only gonna see the side that's facing us. And this is what the brightness should look like over time. On the right is going to show with gravitational light bending effects on the neutron star. So you can see that it's going to appear like it's a little bit bigger. These are the exact same mass and radius, but it's gonna appear larger because you can actually see more of the surface at any given moment. So here you can see how the brightness of the hotspot changes over time as it's towards us and away from us without these gravitational light bending effects versus with the gravitational light bending effects. You can see the brightness changes as the spot is coming towards us. So that is the Doppler shifting towards us and then red shifted away from us. So when it's moving away from us, it's gonna look a little bit fainter. So we can see more of the surface at any given time and that bright spot is always visible, at least in this construct. So here is showing the same thing. Uh, this is what is the technique of thermal light curve modeling. This is just not in a video format. Here it's showing the modulations you would see in those x-rays as the hotspot rotates into and out of our line of sight. And the exact peaks and troughs that you would see depends upon the compactness of the neutron star itself. So for all the same mass, but we're changing the radius. So a more extended radius, we have less of those light bending effects and we aren't seeing as much of the surface at any given moment. This means that we have these very significant peaks and troughs because there's times we don't see it. So obviously our relative flux is going to be lower. As we increase the compactness, we're seeing more of the surface in any given moment, and we really dampen out those modulations that are observed. So that's why NICER was constructed with this very precise timing. Remember how I talked about how the pulsar that was first discovered was roughly rotating every 1.3 seconds? What NICER is looking at is millisecond pulsars, so things that have extremely rapid rotation, which is why it needed that 300 nanosecond timing of incoming photons to really be able to describe where on the rotation it is occurring. So this is a simulation just showing these pulse profiles for one given neutron star that has a known mass. And you can see that the difference in just a 5% difference in radius. So in red is showing if you have a 12 kilometer radius versus a 13.25 kilometers in roughly a million seconds of exposure, you can see a very clear difference in the pulse profile based on those gravitational bending. So this is going to trace out a very small region in terms of mass and radius on the equation of state planes. This is NICER's, it continu um, the NICER's main mission goal is to really help constrain the equation of state. So that's why it was built, but what are the results, right? So NICER released its first results on one of these accreting millisecond X-ray pulsars in 
known as J0030 in 2019. So here are two independent constraints. So two different teams looked at the data using completely different um, software routines, still using the same method of pulse profile modeling, but independent verification. And you can see the region that's traced out on this mass radius plane shown here. So we have roughly a one and a half solar mass neutron star and the constraints in radius itself. The other benefit is because you're actually doing pulse profile modeling, they were able to create the first surface maps of the neutron star hotspots from these two different teams. So you can see they have slightly different configurations that are predicted by their software routines. However, the interesting aspect is that if you notice, both of these hotspots are in the same hemisphere. But when I had showed you those different pulsar models before, we thought they were very dipolar. So you would have a hotspot at one end and then completely at the other end. But it doesn't seem to be the case based on these first results. So this tells us that instead of having these beams of light in the magnetic field that's dipolar, we now have something that's much more complex. And this is still an active area of ongoing research for theorists to tell us how we can create this more complex polar distribution of the magnetic field on the neutron star. So those are two of some of the best methods that we have so far. But going back to what it is that I do in terms of determining radius constraints that are complementary and independent to these approaches is I like to look at low mass X-ray binary systems. So these are neutron stars that have a stellar companion that's roughly the size of the sun. And they are so close that matter is stripped from the stellar companion and flows towards the neutron star, creating a disk of material known as an accretion disk. So accretion is the process where you're converting this gravitational potential energy of the material that's falling in into radiation. So it's becoming very, very hot to the point that it able, is able to emit these X-rays that we then observe. And this is the most efficient way of actually generating energy from matter. This is 20 times more powerful than nuclear fusion of hydrogen per unit mass. And it's a very ubiquitous process. So it occurs all throughout the universe from planet formation all the way up to supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. So why would I be studying the accretion disk around the neutron star if I'm trying to get some kind of constraint on the radius of the neutron star itself? Well, this is just because the disk itself has to either stop at the surface of the neutron star, if not prior to it. So we can use this to get some indirect constraints. And because we're in an extreme gravitational regime, we have that there are some predictions from general relativity that tell us where that last orbit can occur in the accretion disk around the neutron star. And that depends upon the spin of the compact object itself. So this is where spin comes into play. If we have a non-rotating neutron star, then the predicted last stable circular orbit around the neutron star is roughly six gravitational radii. Now, gravitational radii is just a way of measuring a distance, but completely in terms of the mass of the compact object. So we have the gravitational constant and the speed of light those don't change, it just depends on the mass of the compact object. So this is a way of doing comparisons across large mass scales of systems. So non-rotating, we know this should be six gravitational radii. However, if we have rotation, so it, uh, the faster the neutron star rotates, the more it warps space time closer, and we have stable orbits that can be roughly 3.4 times the gravitational radii. So we're getting very close down to the neutron star by targeting systems that rotate more rapidly. Thus, if we determine that position of the innermost stable circular orbit, we know that the neutron star must be lower than that. So we can effectively place an upper limit on the neutron star radius and rule out any equations of state that would predict a more massive radius than we can infer from looking at the position of the inner edge of the disk. So how do we do that, right? How do we figure out where this inner edge of the disk is? What we do is we focus on looking at iron emission lines. So iron is the one of the most stable elements 
with the highest binding energy. So therefore, because it has this high binding energy, it's able to hold on to some electrons in this extremely energetic environment in the inner accretion disk. So if this is showing the levels of our iron atom, we have our electron in its base level closest to the atomic nucleus. And we can have some of these X-rays coming in, interacting with the electron, giving it more energy so that it jumps up to a higher level inside of the atom. After some time, it's going to de-excite, go back down to its ground state and emit a photon. Now that photon is going to have an energy that corresponds to the difference in those energy levels specifically. So this iron emission line is occurring between 6.4 to 6.97 kilo electron volts. So in the X-ray regime, and it, the exact energy just depends upon how ionized the material is. So how many electrons have been booted from the atomic nuclei and how many remain. So this emission line is, again, at a very specific energy. So it's a narrow emission line in a lab. However, because it's in the disk and the disk is moving, you're going to have different effects that are imprinted on the line profile that we observe. So from just Doppler shifts, so we're moving in a circle, we're going to have some of this emission is going to be red shifted and blue shifted to us. So down to lower energy and high energy. This is just showing one being if it was rest frame emission, just so that narrow emission line, and then the lower energy and higher energy are shown here. So we're gonna have a two horn profile, right? And in case you aren't, don't remember Doppler shifting, Doppler shifting is the process by which some kind of wave is either compressed or elongated due to some relative velocities towards or away from your line of sight. So thinking of an ambulance horn, as it comes to you, it's going to sound higher pitched because the wave is shrinking towards you versus after it passes you, it sounds a bit longer. Another effect that is going to occur because we're in this inner accretion disk, in this small radii that we're traveling in highly energetic environments, it, this material is moving at a very rapid pace. So it's going to be some fraction of the speed of light. Therefore, you have to take into account special relativistic effects. So now we get a skewed shape because in addition to just having those Doppler motions, now we have that some of this is beamed into and out of your line of sight, giving some blue shifted towards us, red shifted away from us. Then there's this large gravitational potential well around the neutron star itself. So any photon that's emitted is going to lose energy as it climbs out of the well to escape towards us. In this process of losing energy, it moves the line all down to lower energies. So you can see how this is relatively shifted down to lower energies. All of these effects are going to become more pronounced the closer you are to the neutron star itself. So this is going to create the entire line profile that we can observe in the X-ray energies. So the degree of broadening down to lower energies or what we call the red ring, because it's the red shifted part, tells us how close we are to the compact object. The more extended to low energies, the closer you are because you're climbing out of deeper in the potential well. Conversely, those Doppler shifts depend upon the orientation of the system to our line of sight. So in the way that orientations are defined in astronomy, if something's faced on, that's zero degrees. If something's completely edge on, that's 90 degrees. So at low inclination, so more faced on, you aren't seeing shifts to and from you, right? Because you're looking at the system and having its orbits that are in a single plane. So you're going to have a steep drop in the line profile. But as you increase the inclination, you're seeing more of the Doppler shifts to and away from you, and you broaden this out to higher energies. So the line profile itself has an imprint of all these physical things that are occurring in the innermost accretion disk. So the best observatories to do this data science is using New Star, which is the Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array, one of NASA's missions. And you can see it has focusing optics, concentric shells shown here, two different modules, extending down to the detectors themselves. And as this large 10 meter deployable mast to focus in very high energy x-rays. So this is the first high energy x-ray focusing mission with a sensitivity from 3 to 79 keV. So this is the x-ray band that's showing the effective collecting area of photons for this mission. 
but we can also utilize NICER. So I talked about how NICER does these timing studies to figure out the mass and radius of some of these systems, but it can also look at these low mass X-ray binaries and has large effective collecting area that's complementary to new star to do spectral analysis. So the spectrum is the distribution of the photons per energy. So we're just looking at how many photons there are at one keV versus at 10 keV, let's say. So modeling the distribution of the photons with energy. So the combined pass band of NICER and new star itself, great for the iron lines. You can see how these have complementary overlap in this region. So more photons, more data, more statistics. So what can this do? Here's just gonna show one example that I'm gonna put it all together and you can ask questions. So one system that shows the best constraints that we can get currently for doing this methodology of placing upper limits on neutron star radii is an object known as Cygnus X2. So it's in the Cygnus constellation and was the second X-ray source found in the Cygnus constellation. It has a known binary orbital period of 9.8 days at an inclination of 63 degrees. And this higher inclination has allowed it to have its Keplerian parameters determined from optical studies. So the Keplerian parameters just tell you what the orbital period is, what are the mass of the two objects and the combined mass of the system. And from this, we've determined the mass of the neutron star in this system in particular is higher mass about 1.71 plus or minus 0.21 solar masses. So there are a number of observations that occurred with new star and combined with new star and nicer. So more photon statistics. We have greater than a million counts per spectrum. So we have a lot of data. From applying these models that can model the broadening of the iron line profile, I should say these are the actual iron lines observed. So you can see the emission roughly centered around six and a half keV, broadened down to lower energies as well as to higher energies due to that inclination effect, right? From applying relativistic reflection models to look at the Doppler special and general relativistic effects, we find that the inner accretion disk is consistent with the innermost stable circular orbit of the system, roughly six to seven gravitational radii. And, we also can confirm from doing our reflection modeling that we get an inclination that agrees with what, what was found from optical studies. So that was a good independent check to seeing if we are on the, light, the right um, track with determining our results themselves. So I'm giving you a value with uh, inner disk radius in gravitational radii. And that's indeterminate. I mean, that depends upon the mass of the system. So what does this mean physically? So we're gonna to return to the mass radius plane. Here again, we have mass on the y-axis, radius on the x-axis, so those different theoretical equation of states traced out. We know the mass of Cygnus X2 being 1.7 solar masses. We have the value in terms of gravitational radii. So we can trace out the physical constraints on the mass radius plane. We know at the high mass end of the neutron star mass for 1.92 solar masses, we have a constraint of less than 19.5 kilometers for the radius of the neutron star. At the lower mass end, we have less than 15.3. So how does this compare to the constraints that I've shown for pulsar light curve modeling, which are shown here from those two independent teams? Additionally, NICER has released a second pulsar that they did light curve model mapping, which is shown here, a more massive system. And then we have the constraints from gravitational wave emission. So this is a messy plot, right? We have all of these different regions that are traced out. We have different equations of state. But the important thing to note is that in order for an equation of state to be viable, again, it has to agree with all of these different measurements. Each of these different methods have their own underlying assumptions and set of systematics. So it's important that you're doing this in multiple approaches to get independent confirmation of which could be viable. We know that the ones that didn't agree with the higher mass neutron stars are ruled out. And then we still have some uncertainty into which of these are viable. In the future, something that was asked, but I didn't quite hit on is that 
this is a conservative value from this reflection modeling because I'm assuming that the star is not rotating. There is no measured rotation speed for this current system that I was looking at. So of course, if it were rotating more, we could get higher, if we could really narrow down that region on the equation of state plane. But the point is in the future, we will have better instruments that can really be able to independently constrain the inner disk radius, the spin, and all of these parameters in one. And as NICER keeps progressing, it's gonna have more data, gonna move, excuse me, going to really narrow down the regions that are already measured for these two systems. And as the gravitational wave detectors become more advanced, they're also going to get more detections of merging neutron star systems, which will also narrow down that region. So it's very exciting time to be doing these kinds of studies with advancements that can come out in the future. So I'm going to just summarize quickly and then I can answer the question that I see in the chat right now. So neutron stars themselves really represent a very unique laboratory for understanding how material behaves under different sets of conditions. And these really are an extreme object of the cosmos. We know that neutron stars, the merger at least of two neutron stars, can produce some of the precious heavy metals in the universe that we use for our jewelries. Additionally, we are unable to recreate the conditions inside of a neutron star on Earth itself. That's why it's so important that we look at these systems with observations astrophysically. And by determining our neutron star masses and radii, these are super important for understanding how matter behaves under extreme conditions, because measurements of mass and radii can then determine the equation of state. And then we know how the pressure and density relates in the centermost region of the neutron star and how the matter is behaving. So thank you so much for your attention. I will proceed with answering the question that I can see in the chat, which is, have these two instruments ever looked at SCOX-1? So SCOX-1 is a very interesting source, first X-ray source ever observed. New Star has looked at Scorpion, SCO, yeah, SCOX-1, Scorpius X-1 in more than one way. It's actually looked at it directly head on, but it's so, so bright that you have a lot of dead time as photons interact with the detector itself. The detector has to turn off to read and it's just constantly being bombarded. They actually looked at Scorpius X1 by offsetting their view from the target. So then it's using new star as a collimator and it's only photons coming through the aperture rather than the focusing optics to get some kind of observation. So. New Star has looked at it multiple times. It is very bright. I believe that NICER has also looked at this source as well. Any other questions tonight? That was very interesting. Thank you very much for your time. Um, what do you have a question? Certainly, George. Um, yes, the iron line you talk about, but there are many iron lines around the wavelength of, of six kilovolts. So what do you mm -hmm. do about them? Because there are iron lines from lower stages. They're, all, they're not on one single stage of ionization. Exactly. Correct. Right. Uh, let's go back. Right. So here, yes, you are correct. There are more than just one single atomic species of iron being emitted. What we specifically are talking about are the K alpha lines. There are some wiggle room, but the exact extent down to low energy is really constraining the closest approach to the neutron star. So it is a compilation of the emission line from different radii and different species. So the models themselves do not assume a single atomic transition. It actually assumes an entire composition and is a whole reprocess continuum with discrete lines on top of it that then become convolved with the metric of the space-time close to the neutron star itself. So it basically is fitting towards the line profile itself. Wouldn't the x rism a spectrometer that, that's been launched recently help in this? Yes, it absolutely will. And it is a very exciting time. I am one of the NASA guest scientists on CRISM and we're getting data at the end of the summer to do these kinds of studies. And then starting the end of the summer, September, is when it actually becomes a guest observatory where a bunch of scientists have proposed to do different science with the mission itself. 
and that will absolutely help us in determining what the ionization state of the material is based on the relative strength of the different lines in the iron region. So right now we don't have the energy resolution to resolve those different lines. With CRISM, you are correct. We will learn a lot more very quickly. Yeah, what, what is the density when where you see the iron lines? What, what is the electron density in that region? <laughs> yes, so the electron density around these systems because they're so small, right? So for supermassive black holes, you have a less dense region in the disk, but in these small systems, the electron density is on the order of 10 to the 24 per cubic centimeter. Oh boy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very high. And that's actually a limitation of our models as well. We are actively working on updating the atomic databases to higher densities. Currently we're at 10 to the 19, so we know that's a systematic yeah. in our modeling itself, but that is something that is being extended right now up to densities higher than 10 to the 20. So we're going to get there in time, hopefully, for the CRISM data. Yeah, because you're going to populate, you're going to have many levels populated, uh, you know, thermally populated. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, I see some more questions in the chat. So we have... Um, let's see, we have, is a magnetar a type of neutron star? Yes, yeah. a magnetar is a type of neutron star. They are assumed to be younger. They're, they're assumed to be the stars that have just formed relatively recently because over time your magnetic field will decay in your system. So these are on the order of 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 Gauss. For reference, the Earth itself has about a half a Gauss as its magnetic field. The neutron stars and low mass X-ray binaries are older systems and they are systems that have roughly 10 to the eight power of eight Gauss. So they're very different regimes. There are whole other fields of study that are just on magnetars themselves. Yeah. yeah. I see a question, okay, from one of your initial slides, do we know the general conditions of whether a larger mass star would collapse into a neutron star or a black hole? That itself is also still an active area of uh, research. There are different simulations that are done to try to determine what specific mass will turn into a neutron star or a black hole. There is a limit and it just depends upon the remnant core mass itself. There is an upper limit on the mass of the neutron star that if you exceed it, then you're going to collapse directly into a black hole because now you've over, gravity itself is so strong, it can overcome the degeneracy of the neutrons being close to each other. They will just collapse into that black hole structure itself. It's very complicated because at the end stages of stars' lives, they are losing a lot of mass because they have these winds that they're drying, driving off itself. So that mass really fluctuates and we don't really know from the starting mass of when the star forms, how that evolves through time to become a black hole or a neutron star. That's still an active area of research for determining what conditions at the end specifically correlate to your starting conditions to create those black holes and neutron stars. Let's see. What other questions have I missed? John Birch had one, uh, uh, but I said it on your iPhone. Yeah, yeah. how does the gravity well on the transfer surface? Um, okay, so I think I covered a little bit about that, about that the gravity is so much stronger on the neutron star surface. Okay, so from what I'm gleaming from the question itself, so we know that the gravity on a neutron star is roughly 131 billion times that on Earth. And I think that relates to, you were talking about maybe time dilation. It's, I think the gravity itself is important for determining bending the light itself, right? Bending the light towards us. And that's the impact that we see on the, um, Hot spots as they rotate into and out of our line of sight. So those are those those effects are all taken into account in these different models. Okay, I I see the question that has anyone built a three D gravity wave detector? 
so one with a Z direction into the Earth? And my answer is no. I, I do not know of any 3D detector. But it is an interesting thought. So do we have any, any other questions tonight? Didn't mean to cut people off. They were just a little slow. I didn't see them all. So, but anyway, but we really appreciate your time and your and your answers and, and everything you shared with us. It's very interesting stuff. And it obviously has a big impact on all of the, the things we see out when we go out to observe. Um, and so we really appreciate your time. Maybe sometime you can come to Virginia and visits us at George Mason and see see what we do down here and over here I should say relative to you and uh, but again thank you very much it was great and uh, hope you have a good evening yeah thank you okay and I think with that I think we're done for the night and thank you all very much all seventy something people we had and y'all have a good evening thank you good night.